Welcome back to Poppy Hour, our monthly conversation about California native plants. Uh, today, we are very excited to have be talking about birds and their relationship to California native plants with an avian ecologist, Noriko Smallwood from Cal State LA. Um, but before we jump into Noriko, who we're so excited to have, we have a special guest coming back from six months ago on Poppy Hour, our very own executive director, Evan Meyer. Hey, Evan. Hey, Erin. Hey, everybody. Wow, hey. it's good to, be, uh, good to be back in the Poppy Hour uh, mix. Such a, such a fun time. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. I've been, I've been here the last six months watching, like, like everyone, uh, the amazing conversations that Brenda and Erin are putting together. So thank you, Brenda and Erin, for that. Um, I'm here kind of to, to, today to talk about a few cool things that we have going on. So the first one um, is is our wildflower hotline. I think everybody probably is aware of that. It is, um, sorry, it, it's, it's this year, you know, we're having a bit of a dry season, but there are flowers to be found. And I encourage you to listen uh, and get out there. And we might even have like the Miracle March, who knows, we've gotten a, a bit of rain, so. We might get a nice little bloom out there, but it's uh, it's on our homepage, theaterpain.org. You can find links to the wildflower hotline. Um, tells you basically all the places to go in Southern California to see wildflowers, narrated by the fabulous Joe Spano. Um, and it's just fun to listen to him, even if you're not going to drive out to see him. He's got a beautiful cadence, and to hear hear him riff on the names of all these plants is pretty wonderful. Um, and then the big thing that I'm here to talk about is our native plant garden tour. So it's kind of amazing to think that it was about a year ago, uh, just about a year ago that we did the last uh, Native Plant Garden Tour, which was my first encounter with Zoom ever. And we did uh, a two day extravaganza of gardens um, hosted over Zoom, a Zoom garden tour. Uh, Margaret Oakley and Philip Otto were the ones who pulled that amazing feat off and it was a lot of fun. Um, and I have to say that Aaron, our very own pop, uh, Poppy Hour co-host, um, has been uh, doing just an amazing job with Marie Gonzalez, who's our director of communications and the creative vision behind uh, some of the new aesthetics with Theodore Payne Foundation. Um, and they're they're putting together something really amazing. I mean, it, it is just beautiful. And the first clips are now up on social media. So go to our Instagram handle um, at, uh, at uh, Theodore Payne and you will find you know, the first clip from Casa Apocalyptica, and you can see the caliper of footage. It's documentary style, polished, beautiful. And the goal is to not only show the amazing gardens, show the plants, get into the nitty gritty of how you maintain plants, how you should be thinking about irrigation, all those things um, that we love about a garden tour, but also why should we do this? What is the community of people like who care so much about this? And why do they care so much? Um, and so we've gone around to eight fantastic gardens. We've interviewed, you know, uh, over a dozen people, um, and it's basically telling this kind of story of the of the native plant community in Los Angeles. It's been, you know, being behind the scenes this time. It's just been so inspiring to to hear these stories, and I, I think that if you tune in, you will um, find that you're inspired as well. We also have three panel discussions, um, including the visions for Los Angeles landscapes on our first night. Um, plant care through the seasons, which we'll get into the, how the seasons change and how you should be thinking about maintaining your garden through the seasons. Um, and uh, designing for the environment, which will be about environmental justice and how design and landscape architecture um, can, can be part of that process. So I'm really excited about it. We also have live music and we have local source, our native plant beer being released right before the tour. So there'll be a live tasting and um, Hopefully I'm selling it to you. I'll go to nativeplantgardentour.org um, and check it out. It's it's gonna be it's something that I'm really proud of the team for what they've pulled off. And I think if you're if you're here watching Poppy Hour, um, you will definitely enjoy the Native Plant Garden Tour this year. It's we're going all out. It's a very intricate and beautiful um, beautiful thing that they're doing. So with that, I'm gonna now leave the leave the camera here and and leave it to our wonderful host and. See you guys for the Native Plant Garden Tour. Thanks, Evan. Thank you, Evan. Erin, I have a question. Yes. Are we hosts or are we hostess? 
Because I'm, feel, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like a cupcake right now. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have for us today, Erin? Oh my gosh. So one of the really fun things that we're doing with a garden tour this year um, is, you know, it's a smaller number of gardens so that we can capture this, this footage in the spring and in the winter, but we want to see all of not only gardens, but landscapes across Los Angeles that are capturing the spring, that are capturing the essence of what the garden tour is. And so we, um, we developed a photo contest. And so um, we would love for all of you to participate in the photo contest. And uh, it's really easy. All you have to do is first find a camera. So you can find, find a camera and then you need to find some California native plants. So Brenda, Scott, anybody have any California native plants? Oh, I have some on my desk. I Press see some. flowers. Scott. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, I love that it's a Barbie camera. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. One, two, three. Oh, <laughs> here it comes. Gotta shake it. Oh, wait, you're not supposed to shake it. You're not supposed to shake it. You okay. do not shake it like a Polaroid picture. <laughs> that was before. <laughs> <laughs> so then once you take your picture, you just need to uh, hashtag it <laughs> uh, or you can mail it to me and I'll, um, I'll hashtag it for you. If you take Polaroids and mail them, you will be entered into the contest. Um, you can also take them with your phone, hashtag native plant. No, wait, that's not the hashtag. Well, hashtag native plant garden tour uh, and add the additional hashtag TPF spring 21. And that will enter you into the contest if you're on social media, or you can also email us your photos at nativeplantgardentour.org uh, with a subject line photo contest. And the three categories are spring vibes, habitat, and plants in pots. So we're really looking forward to seeing um, what all of you are up to um, in the landscapes, in gardens, all across LA. That's exciting. Thank you, and Erin. Um, we want to thank our anonymous donor for making Poppy Hour possible. And we'd like to take a few minutes to thank members and supporters for, for tuning in and for supporting um, the TPF. We are an educational found, um, uh, foundation and we support that mission um, through, through the nursery. And um, you may not see everything that we do out in um, out and about LA and the Zoomiverse, but we are uh, doing things in Spanish. We have an uh, introduction, introducción to native plants um, once a month. We have a beading class um, still available. Um, we talk about beading, uh, land acknowledgements, uh, et cetera. Scott, if you wanna drop the link, uh, that would be fantastic. There are still a few spots um, in that class. So with that, let's start with our land acknowledgement. TPF is um, situated on traditional Wicagna lands. We recognize our neighbors in all directions and their traditional environmental knowledge. Um, Flora will be in later um, with plants. Um, so let's start with Noriko. Noriko, thank you so much for, for being here um, with us. So excited to have you and your, your research. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Uh -huh. Tell us a, a little bit uh, about yourself. Um, what's your plant origin story? Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Davis, California. Um, my, my dad is also um, a wildlife ecologist, so that's kind of how I got interested um, in this field. So, you know, I grew up outdoors a lot, um, accompanying him on wildlife surveys, learning about wildlife um, and environmental issues. Um, and then from there, I went to um, Washington State University, um, where I got my bachelor's in environmental and ecosystem sciences. Um, and then that's when I kind of discovered that I um, wanted to go more into the field of urban ecology, um, which brought me to where I am now um, at Cal State LA um, as a master's student in Dr. Wood's lab. Um, and, and that also is where um, my love for native plants kind of came in. Um, when I was research, I, so I, I knew that I wanted to do urban ecology, um, but I didn't really have a specific you know, project idea in mind. Um, when I started talking with Dr. Wood, um, he proposed this idea that he'd been thinking about for a while, which is, you know, how, 
how are wildlife responding to these um, native gardens that we're, that we're converting? Um, and I got super excited about that project. I thought it was a wonderful idea. And that's really what sparked, um, you know, me researching native plants and growing my own native plants um, and becoming excited about my project. What's your favorite plant so far? I have to say manzanita. It's always been my favorite plant. Any specific species or just in general? Um, I don't, so the one, um, when I think of manzanita, I think, I originally think of, um, the manzanitas that are up in the coast range, um, mm -hmm. family and I go, um, went often to, uh, the Mendocino National Forest, I believe it's called, like, you know, north of, um, uh, Point Reyes in the Bay Area, um, and there's, there's manzanita there, I don't know the species, but, um, whenever I think of manzanita, I think of those manzanitas up there. White sage, um, which is another favorite. Um, like you get into this valley and you immediately just smell all this wonderful white sage. So those are my two oh, favorites. That's great. And family memory and that olfactory memory. That's fantastic. Um, so why why are you focusing on urban settings? You went over it a, a little bit, but um, I, why why urban? Yeah. So I guess. When, when I think about, you know, my passion for wildlife and the environment, um, what kind of sparks my interest in, you know, what I want to contribute to the field is, um, you know, thinking about urbanization and thinking about how um, we are impacting the environment. And so then, you know, that makes me want to, to um, help mediate those effects for, for wildlife and the environment. Um, so how can we cohabitate? How can, you know, humans and wildlife cohabitate? Um, and I think that's really like my biggest driver for, for my research and, you know, the career path I want to go into is, is really finding a balance between, you know, us humans living here on this planet and, and wildlife and the environment. Okay. Um, when you talk about contributions to, to science and just uh, contributions in, in general, um, your, your very presence being a, a, a woman in a male dominated field, is, is that something that you thought about while you were doing this research? Not a lot, really. Um, I mean, in, in some ways, yes, you know, um, in, in the field of wildlife ecology, you know, oftentimes we're out in the field, we're alone. So you know, as a woman, you really have to take extra precaution for, for safety. Um, and, but yeah, other than that, I mean, I, I, you know, I believe in equality and, and, and I, I've, I've been, I've, yeah, I've been treated so far. I've been treated, treated fairly and, and equally, um, in, in my field. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be a woman in science and, you know, um, sharing that women can be in science and can be in, in wildlife and um, environmental science. Yeah. Who are your nature heroes? Oh, um, gosh. Um, well, well, you can think about it. We can start your, your presentation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me see. Okay. Well, first it's got dad, of course, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's taught me so much. Um, I, what comes to mind is like, um, well, now I can't remember the name. So, well, that's the main one that comes to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most important should, one. There's others, there's others, but uh, that. it'll come to you yeah. during your presentation. No, no problem. So, okay. Um, are we ready to, to start with, with your research yeah. project? All right, let's do it. Okay, you guys can see this okay? Yes, yeah, looks good. So, let me move the faces. All right, yeah, so um, today um, I'll be talking about my master's thesis project, which is on the influence of native plants on urban wildlife in Southern California residential yards. Um, my name is Noriko Smallwood, and I'm a part of um, Dr. Eric Wood's lab of avian ecology and conservation at California State University, Los Angeles. Um, the, what I'm showing you today are some of our preliminary results. Um, we're not quite finished yet. 
So I kind of already went um, over my background a little bit. Um, grew up in Davis, went to Washington State University. I'm here now at Cal State LA. Um, in addition to being a grad student, I'm a, a consultant at Vargas Environmental Consulting. Um, and my biggest hobby is wildlife, uh, wildlife photography. So you'll be seeing a lot of my photos today. Um, this here uh, is a picture of Tule elk in the Carrizo Plain National Monument and a picture here of a red-tailed hawk in the Santa Monica's. That's an amazing photo of that hawk, Noriko. Yeah, I, it's nice. I, and you know what? The, the red-tailed hawk gets all the credit there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so for some background, um, urbanization is increasing worldwide. Uh, and this is creating mega cities such as uh, here in Los Angeles. Um, so this, this map here on the right shows all of the remaining natural open space. So anything that's pink is remaining natural open space. And to orient you, um, Theodore Payne Foundation is that blue dot there on the top left. And the big chunk of pink on the top of the screen is the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, and then on the left is Griffith Park. So as you can see, there's really not a lot of natural open space remaining here. And what is remaining is highly fragmented. So um, as a result, bird, uh, we've, we've noticed that bird abundance in North America is decreasing rapidly. And so there's really a push to understand how wildlife are responding to these urban environments and how we can you know, help this, this, um, this problem. And uh, yeah, so um, in particular uh, here in LA is home to hundreds of bird species. Um, and it's also especially important habitat for overwintering migrant birds such as this white crowned sparrow. And so again, their response to urbanization is poorly understood. So much of LA's urban land cover is uh, neighborhoods actually with residential yards, um, makes up a large, uh, large portion of you know, that, that urban sprawl. Um, but these yards are often landscaped with exotic trees and shrubs, as well as lawn, um, you know, lush manicured lawns, such as what's in this picture. And so this is kind of more of a traditional approach to landscaping. Um, and I'll re be referring to these types of yards as traditional yards throughout my talk. Um, however, there's a recent trend um, to convert these traditional yards into yards with California native plants. Um, and so as you can see, you know, here's, here, you know, here's an example of a yard that was converted. And now it has a whole bunch uh, more variable habitat um, in the yard. So beforehand, um, in this yard that was just lawn and, and trees, um, you really only had two, two layers of vegetation. And the bottom layer was, you know, basically one plant species. And then the top layer was maybe a couple species of trees. Um, but now with this California native plant or native yard, we have a ground, a really dynamic ground layer um, with a whole bunch of uh, dirt and debris and leaf litter, which are, you know, resources for tons of different animals. We have a shrub layer with many different species of shrubs that can be utilized by many different species. And then again, we have that tree layer. Um, Noriko, I have a question. I can see the mountains in the background, so I'm assuming uh, this is those are the San Gabriels. So yep. this is uh, Altadena, Pasadena. Uh, Correct. Uh, okay. All right. Um, would this be considered urban wild interface or urban? That's a great question. Yeah. So many areas up there, you know, Pasadena, Altadena, I would say they're they're urban. Uh, the term that you used, urban, um, you know, natural interface. Um, you know, a lot of them are up against Eaton Canyon and right up against the San Gabriels. And so you're definitely going to see that influence of, of the mountains in these um, yards. And that's one of the reasons actually why I love Pasadena. Um, there's tons of wildlife there. So that is going to be an influence. You know, if you're in the city center, you don't get that, that influence of a nearby um, open space, usually, you know, maybe if you're next to Griffith Park or something. But a lot of that area is um, just very highly urbanized. Thank you. So here's a few other examples of um, some native yards that were a part of my study. Um, let's see, this one on the right is also in Pasadena, Altadena area. This one here is in uh, Pomona. Um, and also you can kind of notice uh, the picture on the right I took during the springtime. So it's nice and green, there's flowers. The picture on the left was during the winter. Um, so it's a bit more dry, but you know what? It's still beautiful. Still tons of habitat for, bird, or for birds and other species of wildlife. 
And so um, the native yards that we um, often see here in Southern California, um, they often resemble the nearby vegetation communities like chaparral and coastal sage scrub. Um, so this picture here is a, um, was taken in the San Gabriels. Um, and so this is kind of uh, what a lot of these yards are mimicking. So some common plant species um, that I found planted in the native yards I studied, um, you know, the list is much longer than this, but these are just a few of my favorites. Um, mallow, buckwheats, sages, toyon, ceanothus, and manzanitas. All right, so what do native plants provide for birds? Um, first, they provide cover. So shrubs like this manzanita, um, you know, if you compare it to if it were just lawn, there's a lot more dynamic structure in there. There's structure within the plant, and there's also all this dynamic structure underneath the plant at the ground level. And so that's really great foraging habitat for birds. Um, native plants also provide food resources um, like berries, like the cedar waxwing eating toy on berries, um, insects like this grasshopper, nectar resources like um, this bladder pod is providing for an anise hummingbird, and then other resources like nest material or you know, areas to create nests. The pictures are amazing. You oh. took all of you took all of those, right? <laughs> I, I have, yeah. Ran, the most random question ever when you're out there and you're alone. How do you manage not to look like a creeper? Oh yeah. So <laughs> well you you know what? You do end up looking like a creeper. Um I, I wore a, you know, an orange safety vest, um, to, to kind of like show people that I was doing work. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's definitely weird to be out there with binoculars, you know, and a big camera with a big lens, um, look, you know, with binoculars looking like, it looks like you're looking into people's houses. So it's really odd, but you know what, you know, if someone comes up to you, you just, you're nice, you say, you know what? Yeah, I'm surveying birds. And they're like, oh, okay. She's a weird <laughs> Birds. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think a, a safety vest helped, but um, yeah, th and this is a common problem with with you know wildlife ecology work. Um, we're always looking like weirdos out there, but you just have to embrace it. <laughs> <laughs> embrace the weirdo, <laughs> and yeah, the safety vests. Are, yeah, no one, no one shoots at the orange, right? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I sure hope so. Okay, so to get into some background um, on, on past research that's been done in this field. Um, the field of urban ecology is relatively new, um, but there have been quite a few studies in, in various locations throughout the world um, that have shown that native plants do provide better quality habitat for, for wildlife than exotic plants. Um, and there's been some research on, you know, native plant wildlife interactions in Southern California, but there's definitely still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, so some of these studies that have been done um, down here in SoCal are uh, found that um, there's greater insect abundance and richness in yards with native plants. And also a uh, recent study out of my lab found a positive influence of street tree density and birds, and also some cool associations between, um, you know, foraging birds and California native um, trees. So the street trees are any street trees or just native street trees? So they they found that birds really liked native native trees, but they also found that there were some um, species of whoops, sorry of exotic trees um, that were also really great for birds. And I, I can't remember which which species of trees those were um, off the top of my head. But, um, it's this paper here, um, Wood in a Scene, that that found those. Okay. All right, so for my research, um, the main objective was to quantify the importance of native landscape yards to wildlife throughout LA. Um, and underneath that, I had two uh, main objectives. The first, to compare patterns of wildlife and habitat features in 24 native yards um, and 24 paired traditional yards. Um, and second, to quantify relationships of habitat, plant composition, and landscape in native yards on bird and insects. And so to do this, um, for, that, for that first of, um, objective where I'm comparing native yards to traditional yards, um, how I did this was I used a paired sampling design. Um, so I surveyed a, a native yard like this one on the left. And then I also on the same day surveyed a nearby traditional yard. In this case, it was this one on the right. Um, that was a few doors down. 
so that way I get a direct comparison of, of the patterns that I'm seeing. Um, yeah, and I, I can directly compare them. Uh, so here's my study sites. Um, there's 33 study sites um, and 24 of which were used, uh, were, were paired yards, um, like I explained in that past slide, um, where each of these red dots um, is actually two yards. It's a native yard and a paired yard. And then um, the remaining nine yards, so the ones in blue, are yards that were just native yards, and those were used for my second objective. In, on the map, there's a, a big area in the middle where you know, it's the, the, the freeways, that, um, that corridor. Um, is that because you couldn't find yards uh, that had native landscaping? Why are there no um, samples in that area, like Downey, Norwalk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that reminds me, I was going to mention, um, uh, the way I found these study sites um, was just by reaching out to um, actually you guys, and then also I reached out to Audubon Societies, California Native Plant Societies, um, to look for volunteers who would, who had native yards to, um, you know, allow me to survey the yards. So yeah, the, the reason why I, I this is kind of empty is because I just, I didn't get any volunteers here. So, you know, I'm sure there's some native yards, but um, at least with my search and, and the people I was reaching out to, nobody reached out to me that, that had a yard in this middle area. Okay, thank you. Everyone that's asking questions on YouTube and in chat, we will get to your questions um, at the end of the presentation, but keep them coming, please. And then each yard was surveyed three times between October, last October and this month. Um, and then this was to uh, account for the variation of um, wintering birds. And at each yard, I did 20 minute bird surveys where I recorded um, all the bird species that were using the yard. Um, they had to be in the yard, so anybody flying by or next door did not count. Um, and then I also recorded what plant species they were using as well as their behavior. Um, so for example, I would say here that this lizard goldfinch was, um, it, it was hopping around this golden current. And then this Allen's hummingbird was perched on this sugar bush. I also did insect surveys in each of the yard, in, in each of the yards. These were um, observational timed area searches where the time of my survey depended on the size of the yard and the availability of flowering resources. And I recorded um, numbers of bees, butterflies, hoverflies, flies, and wasps. So just um, flying pollinating insects. And then I also did vegetation surveys in each of the yards. Um, I estimated percent cover of tree, shrub, lawn, bare ground, and a few other variables. And I also um, identified all the species of plants in the yard and their relative abundance in the yard. And this was to see, um, these vegetation surveys, surveys were to see if there's any kind of, um, you know, associations between um, wildlife and, and the plants that are in the yard. All right, so getting into some results. Um, these first graphs are, are showing that I found significantly more birds and more bird species in, in the native yards than the traditional yards. Um, yeah, I know this is kind of like the, the most exciting find. Um, was that a surprise or was, was that no. just verifying what you thought? Yep, just verifying what I thought. Um, you know, from, from my first few surveys, I could definitely tell a difference. Um, but, you know, what, what's exciting about it is that this really hasn't been done in SoCal. So it's really, you know, exciting to, to see these same kind of results that, you know, native yards are awesome for, for birds. So I'm gonna exciting. quote you on that. Native yards are awesome. Noriko <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, so that's true. There's been a lot of research on this in other, other places, mm -hmm. um, but to actually have this data for LA is just, it's so cool, Noriko. Yeah, yeah. I'm just as excited as you guys. <laughs> so um, this graph on the right um, is comparing um, total bird richness in the yards um, in, in the native yards versus the traditional. So of course, you know, we're seeing uh, more bird species in the, in the native yards than the traditional yards. And then we're seeing a similar trend for total, total bird abundance. Um, this year's an Allen's hummingbird and um, it was one of the most common bird species that I found in the yards. Both the, the native and the traditionals. 
All right. So looking at um, the, the results so far on our insect surveys, um, we're actually seeing no significant differences in insect abundance and richness in the native yards versus the traditional yards. Um, but this is likely due to the fact that we were serving in the winter. Um, so there weren't, it, it was colder and there weren't a lot of flowering resources out and therefore there weren't a lot of insects out. Um, we were originally planning on having me go out, you know, in, in last spring and summer, you know, and then, and then into the fall and winter, but COVID. Um, so this is, you know, this is when I was able to do my surveys. And so as you can see, like there, there's just a lot of zero values and these are surveys where I didn't see any insects in the yards. And so, yeah, so we're not seeing any significance now, but these, you know, if this were done, you know, with different methodology during a different time of the year, you might see different, uh, different results. Okay. And then one cool pattern that I found, um, was that, uh, in the native yards, um, the the ground cover was heavily used by ground foraging birds. Um, you know, from this um, from all this shrub cover and the ground that's underneath, with all this wonderful um, leaf litter, dirt, and debris, um, I really noticed that the ground foraging birds love to forage underneath these shrubs. So, birds like um, dark-eyed juncos, white-crowned sparrows, hermit thrushes, and California towhees. Those toeys are just so amazing. Yeah, actually, this this picture of this one right here, um, it was actively like you know it was doing that little toey dance where it, it jumps forward <laughs> and scoots back and it's you know <laughs> rummaging around. Yeah, the toey so, two step. Didn't we yeah, do the yeah. toey two step? <laughs> we did. <laughs> <sighs> And then, uh, yeah, this graph is just showing that I found um, more ground foraging birds in the native yards than the traditional yards. Another cool pattern I noticed was that um, large mature trees like like this coast live oak were um, heavily used by birds. Um, and you know that's because with a large tree like this, you have this really enormous uh, tree canopy. And this tree canopy kind of creates its own microclimate, its own micro ecosystem with a whole bunch of insects, a whole bunch of other organisms um, that are food for birds. Um, and then the mature trees, they also, you know, they're, they're great. Um, there's great spots in there for nesting, uh, for perching, for hunting out of. Um, and so like, for example, you'll often find birds like ruby crown kinglets in, um, you know, foraging in the tree canopy. Um, mature trees are really important for uh, cavity nesters like acorn woodpeckers. And then my pictures here of the song sparrow and northern mockingbird are showing, you know, that they're uh, perched on top of these trees, you know, singing, um, calling, and then maybe some other birds, you know, are, they're hunting from these perches. That song sparrow looks like he's doing an aria of some sort. It's like opera bird. He was, he was really, <laughs> he was singing his heart out. Um, and a few um, other song sparrows um, nearby. And then after this photo was taken, they were doing dances with each other. It was really cute. <laughs> What's the best bird you found so far? The most surprising? I will show you at the very end. Ooh, can't wait. <laughs> it's a great bird. Um, all right, so these graphs are showing um, that I found uh, significantly uh, more birds uh, for, you know, for abundance here and more bird species for richness here in the in yards that had a mature tree present. Um, so this is regardless of if it was in a native yard or not, just if the yard had a mature tree in it, um, you know, yes or no. Um, and there were significantly, you know, more birds and more bird species in those yards that had mature trees. And the mature trees are native or non-native? They can be either. Yeah. Okay. And I, um, I haven't looked into yet, um, you know, cause you know, I have many different species of trees and like, which of those were most used. Um, so I haven't looked into that yet, but maybe we'll find something cool there. And okay, so some preliminary regression uh, plots. Um, this one here, we have percent tree cover um, of the yard in, on the x-axis and the total bird abundance on the y-axis. And we see a general positive trend, um, uh, meaning that you know, there's more birds with increasing uh, tree cover of the yard. And this is kind of highlighting um, you know, what I just talked about in the last slide. And then this one here um, kind of shows this hump-shaped curve of um, bird abundance and percent dirt cover. 
Um, and so we're kind of thinking that uh, that means that, you know, birds like this kind of middle area where there's just enough dirt cover for them to rummage around. Um, but if there's um, too much dirt cover, then maybe that yard, you know, is lacking vegetation. And so maybe that's decreasing their numbers. And when they're digging around in dirt, actual dirt, not leaf litter, they're looking for what? Definitely worms, beetles, other little goobers. Uh, <laughs> I also... Is goober the technical term? No. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of goobers. <laughs> I, I, I use the word goober anytime a, a bird is eating some kind of, you know, arthropod that I don't know what it is. Okay. <laughs> I like um, that. Wishies. <laughs> she, uh, I, I also um, surveyed uh, the amount of leaf litter that was in the yards, but we're still kind of looking into those results a little bit more. All right, so um, some conclusions of these preliminary analyses of my study definitely highlight the importance of native yards to wildlife and their ability to provide more habitat for birds. Um, and like I said, we're, we're still working on analyses. So um, one thing that we want to look into is to see if birds are selecting certain plant species or, or groups of species more than others. Um, and, and also tree species, like I was mentioning before. Um, to test if um, there's a difference in proportion of synanthropic birds. Um, and a synanthropic bird is one that uh, is associated with human development. So like, um, you know, rock pigeons, house sparrows, house finches. Um, they could be native or non-native birds, but they've kind of adapted to this urban environment. And so I kind of expect that maybe, you know, the proportion of synanthropes would be greater in the traditional yards because they're, you know, they're used to that, that lawn and, you know, exotic tree kind of, um, habitat. Um, whereas maybe there'd be, um, less, a, le a, a lesser proportion of those in the native yards because in the native yards, we're getting more of those you know, more, uh, less common birds in the native yards. And then also, um, I want to explore relationships of some additional habitat and landscape variables. All right, so um, how to enhance uh, habitat for birds in your yard? Um, well, first, maybe plant native plants. Uh, <laughs> you know, as the, you know, the results of preliminary results of my study have shown um, that there's definitely more birds and more bird species in, in these native um, yards. Uh, you can also um, leave your leaf litter instead of blowing it away or raking it away. Um, and that's really great for those ground foraging birds that I mentioned. Um, maybe keep your mature trees or, or plant trees that will grow large. Um, and again, that, that large tree canopy cover is really great for, for many species of birds. Um, tons of insects in there and areas for them to you know, um, make nests and and live their bird lives. Okay, so this is the most exciting bird that I found. Um, it's a sapsucker, um, which is kind of a more less less common bird here in LA. Um, it was found in Altadena, and it was on an Engelman oak in a native yard. Um, and during my survey, then I got this picture when my, when my survey was finished. So that was it. Wow. That's pretty cool because wow. Engelman oaks are not very common either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and what's kind of really cool about finding a bird like this um, during my survey is that, you know, I, I, I did three surveys in each yard, but that's really capturing only a limited amount of time of, of, you know, time. So what I mean is like, um, if I found one like cool rare bird in a, in a native yard, then imagine how many more, you know, rare birds are using these native yards. Okay. So, um, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Wood and the Wood Lab for their continuing help with my research, um, Pasadena Audubon Society for, um, helping fund my project. Um, and especially thank you to my participants for allowing me to survey your yards. And then I'd also like to thank Theodore Payne Foundation um, for having me on today and also for, um, for also helping me find native yards. I'm glad we could be of a little bit of assistance there. <laughs> oh, you are a, a ton of assistance. Oh, fantastic. So let's get to some of the questions from, uh, from chat. Um, also, one of the 
Go ahead, Erin. Uh, I'm sorry. Instagram is up right now, too, on the slides. If anybody, uh, if you are excited about her bird pictures, which they are amazing. You're an amazing photographer, Noriko. Um, she is at Noriko underscore in underscore nature. Um, and then I think we can. Should we take off the slides? You bet. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, let's see. One of the first questions we had was about bird feeders. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the first question we had was about, um, Noriko, have you examined the impact of bird feeders, pros and cons? Um, no. Um, I did have a few yards that had bird feeders. And what we're going to have to do there is um, adjust our numbers a little bit to account for um, you know, the, the increase in, in birds that we found in those yards. Um, but that, to that, that's the extent of my, you know, research on bird feeders. Um, so, you know, I do know that there's pros and cons. Um, one of the cons meaning, uh, being that, um, they can spread disease. Um, but that's really all I, I, all I can say about bird feeders. They definitely did attract a lot of birds in, in those yards that had bird feeders. Oh, I had a question. Um, someone else had the same question. Richness. Is richness a variety of species or quantity of birds? Number of different species. Okay. Whereas abundance would be quantity. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question. Um, are you under the master's program in biology in the lab or environmental sciences? Environmental uh, science. Environmental sciences. Um, our lab is split though. You can choose if you want to do biology or environmental science. And I, I chose uh, environmental science. Okay. What time of day did you record the birds? I know. Morning. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. No problem. Um, uh, many more birds in the morning is what Kathleen said. Uh, yes. Was there a difference for a morning and afternoon? At, at Theater of Pain, we get bird activity uh, in the afternoon, but it's not the, the bird activity in the morning versus the bird activity in the afternoon, it's still abundant, but it's different birds. Yeah, yeah. So generally with, with bird surveys, um, at least in North America, we, we try and do them in the, in the mornings because that's when you're going to see the most, you're going to hear the most birds uh, singing and calling. Um, so I, that's when I did mine was in the morning. Um, but, you know, there's birds throughout the day. And then they also, you know, um, other species like to come out in the evening. Mm -hmm. Is it true that the early bird gets the worm? I think so. I think so. Especially, I mean, I think about it um, like when when I surveyed extra early, I would get even more birds. So I was being the early bird that was, you know, getting getting not the not the worm, but the, the birds. <laughs> okay. So another question we had. Uh, I read that the LA basin had a dense impenetrable shrub cover before we cut it all down. Do you know what that was? And does that influence what wildlife used to live in the basin? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I don't know a lot about that, but I would presume, you know, it was a lot of coastal sage scrub, a lot of grassland, oak, oak savannas. Um, and yeah, now most, most of it is gone. Um, and so kind of um, learning about how birds are, are adapting to that change is really um you know, what, what me and, and our lab, um, Dr. Wood's lab is trying to uncover. Okay. And yards that had bird bats, was that a factor in uh, the variety of species? So similar to, to um, bird feeders, I did have a few yards that had bird baths and um, definitely noticed that the, the birds loved the bird baths. Um, but um, yeah, and so I might have to adjust for those um, numbers. Um, but again, my same answer with, with the bird feeders, that's kind of the extent of, of what I know in terms of pros and cons. And you this were looking a... just at the front yards, right, Noriko? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Only front yards. So some of those features are also normally in the back. Well, you know, they can be in the front yard, but, um. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of something that's really tricky with urban ecology is, um, you know, I was serving these you know, individual front yards. And I only surveyed, you know, what went inside of the yard, but you know, who knows what was in the backyard, if that was influencing what I was seeing in the front yard, you know, and who knows what was in the yard over that was influencing what I was seeing in my yard. So that's something that makes urban ecology just 
pretty challenging and tricky. And so, you know, these are things that we all have to think about. Yeah. This is a really good question. Did you notice birds or insects having a preference over cultivars versus maybe locally sourced plants? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. And um, I haven't looked into that yet. Um, that is kind of one of the things that I want to look into because I have all this great vegetation data where I, um, I, I know each species in each yard. Um, and so I, I do plan on looking to see if um, there's any kind of um, selection for certain plant species. But so far, I haven't looked into that yet. Okay. I, this is another um, really good question. Um, in terms of trees, were evergreen trees more utilized than deciduous trees? Ooh, that's a good question. Where are all these people coming from with the questions? Know, Thank Rico. you. She's like giving Number us the one. first analysis. Thank you, <laughs> Thank everyone. You. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I I think I only had a few yards that had evergreens most of the most of the trees in my yards were were deciduous and so off the top of my head i can't think of a difference but maybe you know what i'm thinking of is um uh i know that evergreens are definitely used by certain you know bird species like nuthatches and chickadees um and certain species of warblers so maybe um i don't i don't think my study is a large enough scale study to see those differences but if you were to survey you know, a whole bunch of evergreen trees and survey a whole bunch of deciduous trees, you might find um, that certain bird groups are, you know, using one over the other. Okay. And then uh, the other one was about cats. And it's a really long question that I think got a answered later on in chat. But did you notice um, cats being a factor for the foraging birds? You know, uh, presence of a cat, absence of birds, or, or was that a factor at all? That's a little bit tricky for, um, you know, my study because that um, I would have to get into, you know, really surveying cats and I and I didn't. Um, so I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there was any influence there. Again, with urban ecology, you know, there's so many things that um, you would have to take into account. And that's just one of them that's super hard to to account for, you know, in a survey like mine. Um, if we do use bird feeders, what seed should we offer our native birds? See, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> I don't. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, I'm still scrolling. Um, let's see. Seed in um, one of the great ways you can provide seed for your birds is by. Um, is through maintenance. So after your plants, uh, flowers are done flowering, uh, often people will cut off, um, will deadhead, just cut off all of the um, the seed heads. And if you can leave those on for a couple months after the flowers are gone, then you have just, you know, natural bird feeders. It's a really, really great way um, to feed feed the birds. And, and so they're getting cover at the same time. And it also, I think, helps with some of the, um, worries that there are about the diseases um, that could be possibly spread at bird feeders because you get um, usually a cluster of birds of the same species um, swooping in, eating the seed, and then heading out. Okay. Um, question about bird diversity. Um, oh, I just, I, sorry, I just lost it. <laughs> There's a lot of writing on the side of, of the of the thing here, but the question was uh, something along the lines: uh, Did you um, quantify native birds versus non-native birds? And mm -hmm. maybe maybe they mean um, you know year-round um, residents versus the the travelers. So I, I haven't yet, but as that's definitely on my list of things to do. That's one of the things I'm going to be looking into. Nice. Okay, that, yeah, there it is: Bird, native versus non-natives. Um, and then the other one, this is um, really a good question. To what extent does noise uh, affect birds? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, and, you know, I, I know that there's been studies done, um, but I can't, you know, think of the results off the top of my head. Um, but 
I think that's another field of research that's really um, not explored very much, um, if I'm correct. So um, yeah, that, that, that's a great question and, and that interests me to read some of those papers. But I'm sure, I'm sure there's, you know, maybe some, some influence there. Okay, this is another good one. Um, do you know of any studies that have looked at the impact of native plants on soil organisms and how um, that might impact bird richness? Mm, I can't say confidently one off the top of my head, but I, I do know that there's been some research done there. Okay, um, still scrolling. Thank you everyone for posting um, questions. Um, an, another good one about proximity to nature. Does bird abundance and richness um, change with distance from more natural surroundings? That's such a good question. And that's something that I'm, um, that's like next on my to-do list is one of the analyses that I'm going to be doing um, is exactly that. So um, I think, I think, yes, you know, think, thinking again about, um, you know, Pasadena and Altadena and how um, you know a lot of birds there. And I think that's, you know, partly because the mountains are right there. Um, whereas yeah. if you're more into the city center, um, more away from those natural areas, um, you're seeing uh, less birds, which, you know, maybe is influenced by some other things. But I do think that there might, there's going to be a trend there. Okay. So now to the questions um, that came in under the question tab. Um, does a traditional landscaped home, by definition, have less trees and shrubs? What if both um, traditional and non-traditional had equal amounts of trees and shrubs? Yeah, so um, a, a traditional yard, I mean, te technically could you know, could have a lot of shrubs. Um, but for, for my study, I chose, um, you know, I only included traditional yards that had less shrubs than the native yards. So I, I wanted them to be more covered in lawn um, so that everything kind of stayed consistent. Okay. Mariko, um, did you have, um, with your traditional yards, um, did any, do you think anyone is going to think about converting their yard after your research? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, Maybe, maybe. Um, I've gotten quite a few questions. So, you know, maybe that's sparking some interest. <laughs> so we can send them the lawn rebate and a little, <laughs> um, some seed packets. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have plenty of coffee seed packets. Let me tell you. Uh, okay. So I live near the Verdugo mountains. Do you know why we are seeing groups of blackbirds of large blackbirds? Are they blackbirds or are they birds that are black? I would ask this person. Mm -hmm. Mm, so maybe they're American crows or ravens. Um, crows kind of migrate throughout the day um, from from city to to kind of outside of the city. So and and they do it in flocks. So maybe you're thinking of American crows. So there's a few other blackbirds I can think of, but maybe they're American crows. Yeah. So I guess the question would be um, why, but they they just move because of food, right? Um, my understanding, which I could be wrong. Um, it was heat the, the, that, um, you know, different parts of the day, there's different amount of heat in the city center versus outside. Um, but I, I, I could totally be wrong with, with why crows move daily. Okay. Um, and another question, when did you start, um, wildlife photography? Uh, um, when did I, um, about, um, when I went to college, so about five years ago, um, is when I got into it. So cool. Your photos are just stunning. If anybody hasn't checked out um, Noriko's Instagram yet, I highly recommend it. <laughs> oh, did, thank did you. you. Yeah. Did you observe any nest um, tree relationships? No, but that was, yeah, that was something you know, I would love to look into more to see, you know, if there's differences in, in amount of nests in the native yards versus the traditional yards. But um, I, I ended my surveys a bit too soon for nesting season. So I, I didn't observe any nests. Okay. But I know um, that. Yeah. And then um, we had a, a, a question about the graphs. Is that two standard deviations on the graph? So Marisol, if you're there, which graph? Uh, so that we know um, which one you're talking about. And then someone had their hand, um, raised, um, we can unmute you, but I have to find you first. Uh, who was it? 
Kelly. 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 Kelly, are you there? Kelly is my wonderful coworker. She's okay. a chick. Okay, Kelly. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Hi, Kelly. Love it. I love your study. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, I said in the chat that your study and everything that you were finding about the native birds and everything, my gar my home garden proves everything out that a native garden, especially if you have a mature tree, mm -hmm. um, I have coastline of oak, uh, there, I mean, it's just, my garden is alive with more and more native birds so much so that my even my neighbors notice it it's mm. awesome oh i'm so glad to hear it yeah birds do your neighbors complain that your birds are too loud <laughs> no no well you no 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 you have awesome neighbors because some <laughs> of the neighbors complain your birds are too loud like yeah they're just birds they they, they go where they want <laughs> really what oh, about yeah. those birds that learn the car alarms? Oh yeah, mockingbirds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that bird. <laughs> that bird. That's, a, that's an impact of noise on urban bird species. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was that the last of the the questions. Um, let's see. Uh, the birds. So the questions from Marisol was the first graph, the one with the birds in native versus traditional gardens. Oh, the 95% uh, com confidence interval. Okay. All of them. Okay, so I hope that answers Marisol's question. Um, let's see, we're done with those. And we usually have um, Flora um, come in and talk about plants. We had a little bit of, um, of uh, d different circumstances. I don't know if, if you noticed, but I'm in a different space because we moved offices. <laughs> move from one space to another but um uh, I brought some plants yeah like we have plants and Noriko does anyone have any more questions for uh Noriko but Noriko don't go and anywhere uh, just yet thank you so much all right Erin let's talk about um some of the plants because Noriko you you talked about most of these plants in your presentation right mm -hmm. okay yeah so these are three plants um that Flora was going to share with you guys today um, and when we talked with Noriko, these were three plants that um, were important uh, plants for uh, native yards and all appropriate and easy to grow and have a lot of different species. So I brought a little sage here to show you guys. Scott, I don't know if you can spotlight the sage, but um, you all know what sage looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Here we have some beautiful sage. We have a, a number of different, and you saw this also in her presentation, um, a bunch of these varieties in the nursery. Manzanita was the other, and then buckwheat, but my buckwheat sample has gotten a little, um, this is um, the crocodum. It's a silvery buckwheat, but it's a little bit um, Oh, it looks sad. I know, it needs water. <laughs> Oh, Erin, you and your water. I couldn't make it. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, and Andrew, uh, Flora just sent a text saying that the um, salvia that we have in stock right now are the salvia um, columbari and salvia carducea. Am I even saying that right? So the columbari is what? That's the chia, right? That's chia. And what's the other one? Come on, plant people. Someone has to know. <laughs> I don't know what the other one is. Scott probably knows. Cause, probably because I didn't say it right. <laughs> Thistle sage, I think. Is that the common name? Flora, if you're listening, go ahead and text. Answer the questions. I'd like to, to use the... <laughs> no. The hummingbird uh, sage is the spath, spathsia, right? This is mm -hmm. something um, different. Um, yeah, and I also lost my glasses. So this is a spare pair. I, everything is close up is clear, far away is blurry. And if I take them off, it's the opposite. So yeah, 
you were working with, <laughs> with, with, with what we have. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, what did she say? It's a little too soon for blooms, but worth the wait. That's from Flora in her, in her faraway location. Um, there was something else about the, uh, the manzanita. Can you hold manzanita. that one up again? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the manzanita, look at that. Oh my goodness. Evergreen leaves, that beautiful bark. Um, so why these three plants, Noriko? Yes, Noriko, please. They, so, well, like you mentioned, they're easy to grow, right? So, especially here in Southern California. So, you know, if you wanna um, create a, a native yard, you know, that's maybe good for birds. Um, you know, first, maybe you want something that's easy to grow, fast to grow. And then also um, kind of like in those pictures I showed of um, the underneath layer of these shrubs, um, there's uh, really, it, it creates all this leaf litter and debris and wonderful stuff for, for the ground foraging birds. And then also the structure inside of the plant. Um, yeah, and, and they're pretty, you know, and they all have beautiful flowers. And I definitely, you know, notice insects on all of all three of those flowers. So yeah, good easy to grow, available plants. Nice. And um, with the uh, Archistophilus specifically, we have what, close to 200 species, right? Of Archistophilus in California? Some, yeah, hundreds. I don't know the exact, it's, at least a hundred. Yeah, I think with the um, Ceanothus, it's a hundred and 50 and Archistophilus wow. might be like 197. Wow. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. There's a, so there, there's a, there's a manzanita for you somewhere. <laughs> for every spot. <laughs> for, for every type of situation, there is an Archistophilus um, <laughs> uh, waiting for, for you. So, oh, more, more texts from Flora coming in. Lots of buckwheat, California buckwheat, sea cliff buckwheat and St. Catherine's Lace. If you don't know what St. Catherine's Lace looks like, it is as fancy as it sounds. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Uh, but, if uh, anyone uh, lives at the ocean, the sea cliff buckwheat is a host plant for the El Segundo blue butterfly, which has been on the endangered species list since the 70s. So that is a really uh, great example of a picky eater, super picky eater, and um, that you can provide food for. Okay, uh, questions in, in chat. Um, there's uh, number one, great presentation. Um, someone is tearing down a residential neighborhood to build a school using shipping containers and modular units. There will be landscaping, but not sure it will be native. How do you think this will affect the bird population? I would definitely, you know, recommend if, if there's um, you know, uh, some way to reach them to recommend for them to plant native plants, you know, um, not only do, you know, do they provide habitat for birds and other wildlife, but uses less water, of course, you know, so, um, yeah, that'd be great, you know, um, big at a big area like that. Yeah, thank you. And someone posted that we have 261 buckwheat. Yeah, I didn't, um, nice. the buckwheats are they're everywhere. And then uh, the, the scientific name for uh, St. Catherine's Lace, uh, Aragonium giganteum, because the <laughs> blooms are this big. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful plant and it's fancy. And like Noriko said, it's, um, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, okay. Um, any more? Oh yeah. There's more questions over here. Uh, thistle sage. Yeah. So we answered that one. Um, okay, um, any more questions for Noriko? Should we have green roofs on our homes? Green as in the color green or green as in the idea green? Sylvia? So I, I know, um, <laughs> yeah, so those are really cool. And um, so that's like, you know, having, you know, moss and, and, and other, you know, herbaceous plants on top of your roof. Um, those are really cool. I, I know that, um, they're really great for pollinating insects, I believe. So, um, but I, you know, you don't see them a lot in, um, you know, in California. So for some reason they're not very popular, but definitely cool. <laughs> Someone has a ring camera on their garden. <laughs> That's pretty cool to see. Uh, Rhonda, what do you see when you tune in to your ring camera? Uh, <laughs> 
So, uh, Sylvia, we can't hear you. Scott has to um, uh, unmute you. Sylvia, you're there. Oh, can you hear me? We can now. Okay. So we're trying to, we're doing some renovations at home and I became very stubborn about wanting to have a green roof on my, my garage. It's stubborn the right word, Sylvia. Oh. Maybe you were just persistent, <laughs> persistent. adamant. Yes. <laughs> it's just that it came from me. Like I, I, I don't see it here in California and I, here I am dilapid, uh, breaking down my garage and actually um, putting in like a guest house there kind of thing. And I thought, I'm going to push it now. Now's the time. And I immediately said, you know, I want a green roof. I want the support. I want the, the roof to be reinforced so that I can have a green garden up there, meaning that the roof is, is soil, basically. And you can plant anything up there. And the city blocked us saying that it needed to have some sort of perimeter. I can't remember what the perimeter was, but it was quite big. It was maybe like almost the width of a sidewalk, which is just ridiculous really, because then it's basically a roof with a little bit of green in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I found that really, really, really sad um, because there are places in the world where they do do the green roofs. Um, I'm not sure why they're not pushed here. Um, the excuse we got was that for uh, that it was a fire hazard without having the perimeter around. It didn't make sense to me. And well, fire, yeah, fire makes a little bit of sense, especially if it's a driven, a wind driven fire where you don't want to have anything that that's that's flammable. And remember, because of of the physical space where California is, you know, we, we have that very unique climate that only occurs in 2% of, of the world. What 98% of the world does, we can't do. But um, the city didn't mention that. <laughs> well, yeah, and, 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 and so this leads- a uh, perimeter. Yeah, so th this leads um, to another question that someone else had. Um, where, where was it? Um, Rich, um, how do you encourage developers to use native plants or open space? Are open spaces rapidly burning, becoming warehouses surrounded by lantana? So to answer your question, Rich, it's not, develop it's not convincing uh, developers, it's convincing um, your city or whatever municipality you're in, the county, the, um, the state, to require um, native plants be put in because the, a lot of um, street trees, um, Noriko, what were the most common street trees that, that you came in contact with? Thank you, Sid, it, by the way. <laughs> it was definitely a variety. So in the native yards, um, uh, many native yards had native trees. So like, um, you know, oaks and sycamores. Um, were uh, they in the yard or in the parkway? Both, yeah, both. And so if it was in the parkway, I, I still included that, um, but it was definitely a variety. Um, and then in the traditional yards, you know, mostly non-natives, you know, a few magnolias and uh, what's that one called? Camp camphor trees. The camphor is very common in Pasadena. Yeah. Burn pine. Uh, you know, when I, when I did street trees, I could tell how old a neighborhood was just by looking at the trees. If, ah. if, yeah, if your house and, and how much money the neighborhood had, if, if the trees met in the middle like this and they were all oaks, that's a lot of old money in that neighborhood. <laughs> if you had palm trees and they look like this, your house was built last year. <laughs> right. And then there's the ones in the middle that were, um, you know, in the of what 50s and 60s with a lot of uh, the pot of carpus, the fern pines. That's, you know. That was, that's Dodger Stadium. That's what you see all around there, the 50s and the 60s. So that's when those went up. And none of those are, are native with the exception of the big oak trees, right? Okay, so that, I hope that answered that question. Um, I already, I lost my space. Um, let's see, where did he go? Um, well, I hope that answered that question. It's, it's not it's not developers it's um it's law it's the different codes um that have to be um updated um so more texts from flora um okay saint cat oh, saint catherine's lace someone asked if there was a dwarf version of saint catherine's lace isn't it giganteum 
it has a funny name, like Big Giant or Little Giant. It's the uh, compacta variety. There you Sometimes go. Santa Barbara Island buckwheat. Yeah, Gigantium compactium. <laughs> right, compactum. Yeah. There you go. Gotta there you go. Okay, thank you. And someone told me that I'm a great hostess. Thank you. I my my aim is to be a ding dong. So thank you all. <laughs> All right, any more questions for uh, for Noriko regarding her her study? Any uh, any of the information that we saw? Oh, there's one. There's one in the Q and A. Uh, any volunteer programs or internships for biology students this summer? Noriko, is that something that you have um, an answer for regarding the the lab? Hmm. Um. Not that I know of. Um, okay. Yeah, I wish I knew some some things, um, but not that I know of. Okay, so I have a question. If if you were to give advice to anyone that wanted, you know, to follow your your path, what would you tell them, um, you know, to pursue, and what would you tell them to avoid? Ah, uh, yes. Um, I would tell them first to get outside. Um, you know, this, this field is so, um, you know, it revolves around the outdoors and you have to have a love for the outdoors. And the more that you're outdoors, um, you know, the more you see, the more species you see, the more you notice. Um, so get outdoors. Um, now I'm forgetting the question. <laughs> the do's and the don'ts. Okay. Do's, um, you know, of course, Try and, uh, you know, if you're if you're entering college, you know, look into colleges that have, um, you know, program environmental science programs or wildlife ecology programs. Um, um, look into maybe the professor's research to see if that interests you. Um, don'ts. Let's see. What are some don'ts? Don't forget your yellow vest. Don't forget your yellow vest. <laughs> and um, don't give up because. Oh. We need more people in this field. So if you're interested in in this field, don't give up. Keep going. We need you. Okay. And what is next for Noriko in her studies? Ah. Um, okay. So I, I'm um, I'm hoping to graduate uh, this May, um, if all goes well. Um, might be extended a few months, but we're hoping for May. Um, afterwards, um, you know, just hoping to to um, either continue with uh, the consulting firm that I'm working with um, to continue with them full time, or potentially, um, you know, um, find other other jobs. Um, I'll be applying just to see kind of who bites. Um, but yeah, and then uh, perhaps a PhD in the future. Um, but for now, I want to work for a few years. Okay. Awesome. And um, we're waiting for Flora to um, to kind of join in the conversation for everyone that had. Uh, horticulture related questions we're having she's having a little bit of um, connection issues but we are trying to to get her um, on so in the meantime any more questions comments about the pictures um, because Noriko um, you I don't know if you can see the the chat but your pictures have gotten rave reviews um, <laughs> I want to know um, like what what is the most embarrassing thing that happened while you were out there taking pictures <laughs> Embarrassing. Well, you know, and you also I, don't have to answer if you don't want right. to. Well, embarrassing in the sense where that you can laugh about it now. But <laughs> oh gosh, I there's got to be one. Um, um, I mean this this wasn't in in my yard surveys with you know my master's work, but you know um, I've gotten the police called or you know not that yeah you know we've we um, we've noticed you know, police cars pull up and, and watch us, um, oh, you know, yeah. out there with binoculars and looking weird. So I guess that's not embarrassing, but, um, that's scary. Was yeah. There, was there a contact made or they just, no. you know, observed and left? Yeah. Okay. Um, gosh, I wish I, I totally wish I had something embarrassing. I would, I would absolutely share it, but I can't think of anything. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, maybe just, I, do, I don't mean embarrassing. Maybe let us say that, you know, the most interesting, the most memorable. Um, I guess just all those moments when I was, you know, I was looking like I was looking in somebody's window and then <laughs> walked by, you know, cause I was looking at a bird in a tree, you know, and then, but it, 
you know, it's in the same line of vision as their window. Um, and then someone, you know, walks by and gives me a really weird look. And I have to kind of just be like, it's, it's a bird. <laughs> that, yeah. There's just many of those one. moments. This yeah. That's a good one. Um, have any hummingbirds, um, any hummingbird dive bomb you during your study? Yeah. Because you know they're territorial. They're very territorial. Yeah. You get lots of that, especially right right now, um, this, this time of year. Tons of hummingbirds dive bombing being territorial. They're so cute. We should no, be very not. happy. They're so small. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They're being incredibly yep. dangerous. <laughs> they're, yep. they're like they're like torpedoes with with swords. They're, they're Giant swords. Yeah, Giant like swords. half. What is it? Like a third of their whole body length is nothing but sword. Yeah, that <laughs> they're they're pretty scary. So, uh, Noriko, will your study be published or otherwise available? Yeah, that's the hope. Um, published is the hope. Yep, hopefully happen soon. Okay, awesome. Um. And I guess this is a, a Hort question, um, um, Noriko, unless you would like to chime in. Do you have any advice for growing um, California native plants in planters for people who live in condos or apartments? Is that even possible? Scott, Scott, what do you have to say about that? I actually go ahead and post to the chat box uh, right now. We do have monthly uh, native plants and containers classes, actually. There's a lot that you can grow in containers. There are a few favorites, but uh, we like to tell people to be adventurous. We've seen some pretty cool um, examples of native plant container gardening with a ver wide variety of species. So I'll go yeah. ahead and post that. It's uh, it's led by our own Flora Ito. And yeah, at this point we're doing it about monthly. Yeah, we also have um, on our website, the um, balcony mix of seeds, which are um, plants created specifically for containers. Um, and if you go to our YouTube channel, um, last week, I'm sorry, last month when we had Brandy, um, in from Garden Butterfly LA, that presentation was almost entirely on container plants. And, um, uh, for those of you that don't know, our, um, poppy hours are archived and available, um, for later viewing on YouTube. Okay. And Flora, we have several pre-potted plants available for sale at TPF. Okay, so um, in case we didn't mention it, um, next week is Poppy Day, Poppy Days. Next week is, next week are Poppy Days. It's our, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, English is not my primary language. <laughs> uh, we have Poppy Days coming up next week. It is our spring sale where members save 15, the public saves 10% on um, all plants and uh, make your appointment now. I don't know, uh, Scott, if you want to drop the, the link to that. Thank you so much. Um, were there any more questions on YouTube that we may have mixed, missed? No. Enrico, is there, um, did you say that Alan's hummingbird was one of the birds that you saw the most frequently? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's super interesting because that is a bird too that wasn't its range originally limited like to the Channel Islands or something really? Ooh, is that so? I'm not, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it's Alan's. Anyway, I'm going to look it up because if that's true, that's really fascinating that that would be one of the ones that you're seeing the most of. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a, a question. Um, what does Noriko do as a consultant? Mm, um, yeah, various jobs um, uh, with Bargus. Um, the most common um, <clears throat> being with um, Southern California Edison pole replacements. Um, so monitoring uh, birds and other wildlife as uh, throughout that process. So pre-construction, during construction, um, oh, some wow. construction. That's the majority. Yeah. And that's when they're switching out the, what happens to the, to the poles, the old poles that are full of acorns. <laughs> so sometimes they leave them. Uh, yeah. Um, I've been to some pools where, um, you know, they put in that, the, the big new pole and then they leave part of that old pole that was granary. Um, but yeah, I think if, if it, if it's not, then that old pole is, um, they chop it down, they chop it into little pieces. And then does it get turned into mulch or it just? I, I hope so. <laughs> like what happens to the trees? Okay. 
Um, yeah, so the Flora is still having connectivity issues. So I'm so sorry for anyone that had um, uh, question, any more HORT questions and we didn't have our, our usual um, uh, segment at the beginning, uh, but that's okay because we can talk about different things that TPF is, is doing. Um, let's see, um, the, we talked about the plant sale, we talked about garden tour, we talked about- I have about some t-shirts to show you. <gasps> oh, t-shirts, wardrobe, do, 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 do. <laughs> All right, Scott, t-shirts. <laughs> you see them? Yes. Oh. Look at that. There it is. The Humboldt Lily. And this is um, one of our samples. And so we will have these, they're available for pre-order right now. Um, and they will be, uh, they should be arriving in the next week or so. So those orders will start shipping soon. If you wanna pre-order your Garden Tour 2021 t-shirt with the Humboldt Lily. Why did you choose the Humboldt Lily as the, the, the this year's plant? Is it so top humble, secret? No, okay. no, it's, uh, it's actually a really fascinating. Um, so the theme for this year's garden tour is uh, the changing of the seasons. Uh, so we're capturing this winter footage and then spring footage, and then going back in the fall also to catch dormancy. And the Humboldt Lily has this incredible life cycle where um, they're emerging right now from the ground. So two months ago, uh, you would have seen just bare dirt. Uh, the bulbs were underground and then they start to emerge. Right now, they're already about four to five feet tall, <laughs> which is a huge, like a lot of growth in a short period of time. And they grow up to eight feet tall and can have up to 50 blooms on them. And they have these huge flowers. And then, um, so they'll bloom around June and then they go completely dormant. They will die back all the way to the ground, disappear uh, and reemerge next year again as an eight foot tall giant flowering <laughs> plant. So they, it's a great illustration of how dynamic our seasons are. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, and um, to make it clear to everyone, is it Humboldt Lily or Humboldt Lily? Oh gosh. <laughs> Let's do an is audience that a, poll. Is that, that, a, is that, that a trick question? <laughs> I, I don't know. Scott, Noriko. I've seen it both ways. I'm looking at the shirt page right now. So I'm <laughs> well, what does it say on the t-shirt? Humboldt Lily. There you go. That must be correct. That's got to be it. <laughs> and you guys, look, uh, the bar is set really, really low on our photo contest right now. As you can see, this Polaroid <laughs> captured basically nothing. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so we hope that um, this in inspires you to go out. There's a good chance you're going to win because I'm clearly not going to win. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you have someone on the inside that can make you win. Just say it. <laughs> Brenda, I also um, want to share this. Um, we just got these new masks in too. Oh, ooh. Merch plug. This is our new TPF black mask that has the California poppy on the side. That's nice. And they are on sale now in the store. And those are available on the website? Yep. Okay, so more questions came in. Um, what was it? Uh, where did Noriko get her poppy necklace? Oh, <laughs> um, my uncle's a jeweler. Oh, damn. From my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> does he That's have a, Does he have a website? Uh, I think he does. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, share it. <laughs> and his jewelry. Is it just, does he do native jewelry or just jewelry? And, yeah, and jewelry? all jewelry. Um, yeah, it's, uh, he has a store in Laguna Beach. Okay, that's cool. cool. Um, um, uh, are the weekly blooming announcements still occurring? Um, I think that means uh, the, the, the hotline, right? The wildflower hotline. Um, so who, who was it? Who asked that? 
Um, the hotline, Linda, yes, the hotline is still going. We just started. It'll be going through the middle of April. Um, it is, uh, you can call now and updates happen every Thursday, um, I believe. If not, it's updated um, on, on Friday. So yeah, it's, it's going. Um, we haven't got a, a lot of rain, uh, but that doesn't mean that we won't have a bloom. And I'm going to sound super, super old right now, but I remember... 1995, the, that Easter, it snowed. <laughs> it snowed Easter Sunday, I remember, because I was in Altadena, and it was snowing just above uh, the, that little ridge behind Eaton Canyon. So it's very possible that we'll get the, the late rain. So just, you know, hang, hang in there. Um, so anybody else have questions, like court questions? Uh, Flora can hear us. She just can't connect. No heart questions, no more questions for Noriko's. Uh, Noriko, can you, um, uh, could you put in chat the name of your uncle's business? Mm -hmm. Now. <laughs> Ken's Jewelry, Laguna Beach. Thank you. Now we're all, he's going to have a rush. <laughs> poppy ne <laughs> poppy <laughs> necklaces. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. So, uh, Noriko, we went over your your favorite um, plants. Yeah. You, you know the the Archistophilus and the the different sages. What's your least favorite? Mm. Ooh, hmm. You have one. <laughs> huh. <laughs> um, favorite. I'm trying to think of some, is there one that like smells bad that I don't like? One that's pokey. <laughs> one that's one that gives you. you a rash. Yeah. Because those plants are sneaky. They come out of nowhere and they just, you know, <laughs> leave pokey things all over your clothes. I think I love them all. Um, have I ever had a bad experience with a native plant? I don't think so. Gosh, I wish I could answer. <laughs> um, You've never uh, stepped. You've never stepped around a jumping choya and experienced why it's I, called jumping I, choya. I almost said choya, uh -huh. but I haven't. I haven't been poked by one, and they're just so cute. So I, I know they are cute. They're, they're too cute. There, there, there is a species called teddy bear choya, but I think that's from Arizona, right? And I'm like, yeah, that does not look cuddly at all. <laughs> but okay. Um, so, question: uh, Does bladder pod smell good or bad? Anyone? <laughs> I don't it know. Smells bad, but I, I've never, I've never not liked the smell of it. So, but maybe I haven't been there in the right time. So, yeah, it's, it's called bladder pod just because of, of the shape, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the ones that people say smells really uh, bad is the, what, the melosma, the uh, laurel sumac. It smells like laurel sumac. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it doesn't smell bad. It just smells like uh, Laurel sumac, and you know it's um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's there's no such thing as good or bad. It's just it just smells, you know what it what it what it's supposed to smell like. Um, okay, so thank you, oh, Jesse. Jesse, are you the one from the school, Jesse Chang? Yeah, Laurel sumac smells like green apples. Oh no, not to me, but okay. Um, so Jesse, Jesse, if, if that's you from the school, I can't remember if you and I used to work together. Is that him? Yeah. yeah Jesse, <laughs> Jesse was really helpful for me in finding yards. Oh, okay. Oh, awesome. Okay. Jesse, Jesse, uh, if it's the same Jesse, uh, does vernal pools in, um, in school, on school sites, right? Is that that same Jesse? That sounds correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, okay. Guys. Okay. So yeah. So without um, Flora's presentation, we're um, I'll, <laughs> we're that's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Seven o'clock. We can call it unless anybody has any more um, questions. Um, no. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for for joining us for bearing with us um, through the connectivity issues. Uh, we really really appreciate our sponsor, you know, the um, anonymous donor and all of our members and 
our guest, Noriko, thank you so much for, for joining us, staff support. Thank you, Scott, for running the, the board and Aaron for holding it down. Um, thank you all so much. Next month, we will have um, uh, climate science um, climate scientists from JPL, Robert Ha and Robert Clem, and we'll talk about native plants and climate change. Um, so look for that on our event right coming soon. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for Enjoy having me. Thank you, Noriko. You were awesome. Thank you, Noriko. Thank you. It was such a joy. <laughs> Your research is fascinating. We're so excited to have some data we can throw out. <laughs> right? Yeah. Local data. I'm so excited. I'm, I'm so glad to share it. Awesome. So yeah, all the comments coming in. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Fantastic. So thank you, everyone.